this video we will explore creating materials using the V-Ray standard material and focus on some of the most commonly used ones. Let's start by creating a couple of opaque or in other words non-transparent materials. Alright, navigate to your V-Ray materials and create a new standard material. The first one we are going to create is a wood material using textures as inputs for the different channels. Let's place a very advanced bitmap shader and browse the diffuse texture. Although placing your texture inside of an advanced bitmap shader is not necessarily per se, it gives us some basic color correction options which can be quite handy and also enables us to use distributed rendering without baking any textures. Let's do a quick test render now just to make sure that we don't have any unexpected results. Ok great, let's move on. Next on the list of the channels are the reflections. Reflections are arguably one of the most important characteristics of any material. The two building blocks of a good reflection layer are color and glossiness. Starting with the color, the main rule of thumb here is that the reflections are brighter than the diffuse layer. You can always just use a brighter color from the color swatch, but it is a good practice to mix that one with the diffuse color. So let's copy the diffuse texture and mix it with an off-white color. When it's set on 1, the mix value slider will only use the texture and when it's lower to 0, it will completely ignore the texture and only use the color. Let's render again. Alright, let's move on to the glossiness related settings. Most everyday materials have a correlation between their highlight and reflection glossiness. That's why unless you aim for a very specific look or a material, the highlight glossiness checkbox should stay ticked. The reflection glossiness slider controls how perfectly shiny a reflection will finally look. Values closer to 1 produce sharp and clean looking reflections, while values closer to 0 gives us more rough and blurry reflections. Using only the slider will always generate uniform looking reflections. That can be just the look you're after, but more often than that, we need some variation in our reflections. For that, we can once again use a texture. Let's browse to find a noise texture. The textures placed in the glossiness slot should be black and white. The darker values will produce rougher looking reflections and the whiter values will generate clean or shinier reflections. If we compare it to the glossiness slider above, the black values of the texture are equal to 0 and the white values equal to 1. The glossiness slider value and the bitmap can also be mixed together using the mix slider below the texture slot. Next, you will see the Fresnel function, which is essential for creating photorealistic materials, so let's keep it on. However, note that for opaque materials, such as our wood material, we do not have to lock its index of reflection value to the refraction channel. The default value of 1.6 is a great starting point for most cases. And for this particular material, I know that I would like the IOR to be slightly lower so let's try something around 1.5. Let's do a test render here. Alright, let's move on to the last layer we need to create for our wood material, the bump channel. Right now, the wood material lacks surface definition meaning we need to introduce some surface unevenness or irregularity. We can use the default bump mapping or select one of the normal map types. For this material we have a normal map, so let me switch to the proper mode and find my texture. Regardless which bump type you end up choosing, 
Always keep in mind that the bump and normal values in the real world are rather small. So if you find yourself in need of a larger value, then you might want to consider using a displacement material or modifying your geometry. In this case, let's enter something around 0.5, which should be enough for this material. Now let's see how the material looks. Alright, it's time for the second material. This one will be a concrete shader and since most of the steps will overlap, I will proceed quickly until we need to tweak the bump channel again. This time, we have a black and white texture, and that means we need to feed it into the bump map slot, rather to the normal one. The rest remains the same, and we still need to be mindful about the bump amount. Larger values will not only slow down the calculations, but they will also mess up the reflections. Let's do a test render here. Since the concrete material itself will benefit from deeper irregularities in the geometry, I am also going to create a displacement material. We have a black and white displacement texture here, so let's make sure we set the texture type to luminance so it reads the bitmap correctly. Now let's enter 1 cm for the displacement amount and counter that movement with a value of minus 1 cm in the shift field. That way our mesh won't change its position while it's being displaced. Also uncheck the use global parameters box so we can modify a few values. View dependent switches between world space and screen space. When it's on, the value of the edge length is measured in pixels and not in world units. I think a value around 2 pixels will do just fine. The key takeaway here is the view dependent and the edge length values work together. Lower edge length values produce finer displacement results but also take up considerably more memory. The max subdivs value controls the amount of tessellation for each poly and it's only a square root of the final amount. That means the default value of 20 is actually 400, so in case you find yourself raising this value by a significant amount, it might be better to additionally subdivide your original mesh. Now that we have seen how to set up non-transparent materials, Let's move on to explore more shader types in the upcoming lessons.